So anyone who's followed me for a while will know that one of the main focuses of my channel is cancer treatments, scams and frauds. In particular, I'm interested in people who promote so-called alternative or natural remedies for cancer. These supplements, products or systems are often promoted by people posing as doctors and I frequently said that the advice they give is dangerous to their patients or rather their customers. One of the main ways that these natural healing coaches make money from their victims is by selling consultations over the internet via Skype or Zoom. Over the last few weeks I've been writing a video about Mark Circus. He describes himself as a doctor of natural medicine, which means nothing, but that doesn't stop him selling these expensive ebooks and consultation packages. After reading Mark's articles and watching his videos, I began to wonder exactly what Mark says directly to the people who pay for his clinics, so I decided to buy a consultation with Mark and pose as a cancer patient. I bought the half hour Skype call for $125 and I filled out the patient intake form which I emailed to his assistant and she arranged for Mark to talk with me over Skype. So my cover story here is that I'm a patient diagnosed with testicular cancer and I've been advised by my doctor that they would like to remove the affected testicle and proceed with a course of chemotherapy and maybe radiation depending on how advanced the disease is. And this is how a real case of testicular cancer would be treated. I chose this kind of cancer for a couple of reasons. Firstly, although it is a rare cancer, it's the most common type of cancer for men in my age group. I don't expect Mark to do any research, but it seems sensible to make my case plausible. Secondly, testicular cancer is very curable with conventional treatment. In fact, the vast majority of patients will be cured by surgery, chemotherapy, and maybe radiation, and the cancer won't come back. Now this is important because natural health coaches often spend a lot of time demonizing surgery and radiation, and chemotherapy in particular. They'll often tell you that it's dangerous or that it doesn't work at all. In some cancers, the survival benefit conferred by chemotherapy is modest, but in testicular cancer, the effect of chemotherapy is profound. In the early 70s, testicular cancer that had spread to the rest of the body was associated with around 5% survival, but today survival is around 80%, and much of that difference is due to the use of chemotherapy. If you read articles about this kind of cancer, people generally refer to the period of time before and after cisplatin as essentially different eras in treatment. So I've set the scene. I'm a patient suffering from a kind of cancer that is easily curable with a simple surgery and a follow-up course of chemo. So let's see what words of wisdom Mark Circus has to share. Oh, that's better. Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you now. Okay. Okay. So, 29 with a diagnosis of testicle cancer. Shit. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's been quite um quite a surprise as you can imagine. Um, do you want me to talk you through kind of what happened or? I guess today you really need to hear me, but I can, I can imagine what you're going through. Yeah. Um, one of the things one of the things I would need to hear about would be your emotional history more than your physical history. Um, but basically what I'm hearing from what you wrote to me is you really have to decide what, what you're going to do. You can either follow the doctors and cut off one of your balls, do chemo and radiation, right? Is that they said? So they said it would depend on... Yeah, possibly uh, radiation. Possibly radiation depends on the results of, of maybe the scan. Yeah. Yeah, which is really shit. I mean, the whole chemo radiation trip... For, and let's not even talk about the surgery for, for for right now. It's it's dangerous. The radiation increases your chance of getting cancer again or someplace else. Because every dose of radiation in, is you know science, basic science, physics, in, it provokes cancer, increases your chance of getting cancer. Bottom bottom line, for somebody in your situation is that you have nothing to lose by doing very aggressive natural treatments first. Okay, so straight off the bat, there are a few weird things going on here. What kind of doctor would talk about cutting off someone's balls? It's a very crass and insensitive way of talking about this kind of disease. It's also weird that Mark isn't interested in learning any of the details of the cancer. Apparently, he'd rather talk about my emotional state, but more importantly, I need to hear from him. And of course, Mark completely unprompted jumps straight into trashing chemotherapy and radiation, which, as I've said, confer a very significant survival benefit to men suffering from this type of cancer. To respond to his concern about radiation causing cancer, 
whilst it's true that exposure to radiation can increase the risk of developing cancer, it can also cure an existing cancer. When doctors use radiation, they have to make a judgment based on the risks and benefits. If the benefits of using radiation in the short term outweigh the long term risk, then it's sensible to move forward with the treatment. This is the same calculation that has to be made for any medical intervention. Mark also said that I have nothing to lose from trying alternative treatments. So let's cut back to my consultation because I want to ask him more about that. Do, would there yeah. be any risk? Would there any be what? any risk to to delaying the surgery? Because obviously the doctors have said that the faster I would do the surgery, the, the better, because that could prevent it from spreading. But do you think there's any risk to delaying the surgery? Well, not according to them, no, because there, like the first first basic therapy will stop the cancer in its tracks. If we bring up your urinary pH up to eight, cancer not spread in a highly alkaline environment. Okay. And a very, very good chance it'll shrink and disappear. Right. But if you can, and you can do that in one day, bring up your total, you know, your, all the fluid in your body up to eight. All of the fluid up to eight. Would, would, would that yeah. be dangerous, like including my blood or? No, the blood, of course not. You can't, you can't do that without killing yourself. Okay. But that's not a problem. You take, there are three things you can take to get your pH up to eight. Sodium bicarbonate, which is base baking soda, potassium bicarbonate, and magnesium bicarbonate. Right. Bicarbonates will bring up very quickly, I mean, within 24 hours, your, P, your urinary pH up to eight won't change your blood. It, it eventually changed the blood a little bit. And at that point, and you should read, I, I have essays on this, this, you know, some of the newest research, cancer research from the Ludwig Cancer Center is just exactly about this. What happens when you bring pH up? What happens to cancer? Okay. And I could talk about that, but th there's other things to talk about. Um, so that, that negates what the doctors are going to say. It's like, oh, you need to rush because the cancer might spread. Well, you can very quickly free, you know, forget about get, getting rid of the cancer as a first step, but definitely freezing the cancer. Okay. And then we work to get rid of it. Okay, so Mark says that there's no risk to delaying conventional treatment for my cancer because he thinks that baking soda or bicarbonates will stop the cancer growing in one day. So there are two false statements here. The first is this idea that bicarbonate can stop cancer growth. There's just no good evidence to support that claim. There are no human trials showing that baking soda can slow or halt the growth of cancer or any trials showing that patients live longer whilst taking bicarbonate. Mark mentions research conducted by the Ludwig Cancer Center as supporting his claim. But the Ludwig study that Mark is referring to here investigated the effects of bicarbonate given to mice with grafted tumors. They didn't measure the survival of the mice, and there was no mention of any differences in the amount of tumor growth. What the researchers in fact concluded was that baking soda restored the cancer cell's internal clock, and their main hope was not that baking soda could be used to kill cancer cells or slow their growth, but that it might make cancer cells more responsive to chemotherapy or immunotherapy. So much for the title of Mark's article, Massacring Cancer with Oxygen and Bicarbonates. The research simply doesn't support his claims and his ideas, and we'll come back to this later. Mark also said that delaying treatment would not carry any additional risks, and this is false. In general, cancer patients benefit from rapid treatment, and delaying treatment can lead to worse outcomes, and somewhat ironically, more treatment. If you wait for the cancer to spread, the surgery or the chemotherapy may have to be more significant. In the case of testicular cancer, that association is less pronounced, and this could be due to the treatment being so effective it can even reverse disease that has progressed, but I have the sense that Mark is giving his advice as a general principle for cancer patients, not only testicular cancer, and it's bad advice. There have been several studies which have shown a link between the use of alternative medicines by cancer patients and worse outcomes. One of the proposed explanations for this is that cancer patients might be delaying or ignoring effective treatment to dabble in alternative medicines, which is exactly what Mark is encouraging here, saying that I'd have nothing to lose. But let's go back to the consultation because Mark isn't only proposing bicarbonates. And my, my basic work is, would be to teach you to set up an intensive treatment center, like an ICU, in your home to comfortably treat yourself 
on a very intensive level, but it's um, more like spa treatments. It's, you know, it's nothing... Okay, so it's like an ICU where you get spa treatments. I have to wonder if Mark has ever been to an ICU, or a spa for that matter. Now, apart from being a stupid juxtaposition, there's a serious element to this. By using the language of medicine, he's fooling people into thinking they'll be getting the benefits of real medicine. If a cancer patient tells their family, or even convinces themselves that they're in an ICU receiving treatment from a doctor, that probably seems like an appropriate response to a serious disease. But in reality, they're just sat in their front room drinking baking soda and video calling a crank in Brazil. I think the choice of language here is deliberate, and I think it's a pretty insidious approach from Mark. But back to his proposed treatments. The hardest part of the treatment, which you need, which does relate to the bicarbonates and to the pH is you need to slow your breathing down. You're breathing way too fast, and it's probably one of the basic reasons you got cancer. Okay. The faster you breathe, the faster you breathe, the sooner you die. The faster you breathe, the less oxygen your cells get. Why? The faster you breathe, the more CO2 you blow off the blood. Okay. When you exercise, it's very healthy because you get a lot of CO2 and you have to breathe faster to get rid of it. And by consequence, you get more oxygen, more CO2, more oxygen. But when you're sleeping and sitting around and watching TV or working at your computer and you're breathing too fast, you're getting rid of too much CO2. Okay. And that, that, that diminishes oxygen delivery to the cells. Right. So there's a, like a $50 device that comes from Russia that makes it easy to slow your breathing down. And if you're willing to seriously work on lowering your breathing rate, now, 70 years ago, the medical norm was eight breaths a minute. You're at 15. Okay, so one of the questions on Mark's patient intake form was how many breaths I take a minute. I did indeed answer 15 breaths a minute, which is in the normal range. Mark says that 70 years ago, the normal was eight breaths per minute. In fact, 70 years ago, The Mechanics of Breathing in Man was published, in which the authors calculated the mathematically optimal breathing rate in humans and determined it to be around 15 breaths per minute. And they pointed out that the optimal frequency in this case is in the range ordinarily observed in the breathing of resting subjects. So not only is 15 breaths per minute perfectly normal today, it was also normal 70 years ago, and it is the optimum breathing rate for humans at rest as defined by our biology. Mark has a strange topsy-turvy understanding of the relationship between breathing and oxygen supply. I don't really understand why he thinks that breathing more reduces oxygen, but he's wrong. Faster breathing supplies more oxygen, that's why you breathe more when you exercise. I think this relationship between breathing rate and cancer is probably not important, but the only studies on this that I could find seem to contradict what Mark is claiming. Mark says that breathing too fast causes cancer, but this paper titled Sleep Disordered Breathing and Cancer Mortality found that people who struggle to breathe at night are at a greater risk of dying from cancer. So these are people who are not breathing enough at night, and the authors suggested it could lead to hypoxia and eventually to cancer. But anyway, let's go back to the consultation. You know, we only have a half hour today, and I could tell you a lot, of, a lot about that, and can read a lot about that. But I'll tell you, there was in my book on sodium bicarbonate, uh, which I wrote like 10 years ago, there was a guy had prostate cancer. It had spread to the bones. He did the bicarbonate therapy perfectly, and he, he didn't have this machine to make it easy. He breathed consciously four hours a day, and he got rid of his cancer in 30 days. Right, so... You're saying that I can, do you think I can cure my cancer by changing my breathing? With the bicarbonate. Multi-pronged attack. So there was a strange pause there when I asked Mark if I could cure my cancer by changing my breathing. Perhaps it sounded stupid even to him. I'm not sure why Mark had to ponder on that question so much, although he did tend to add... Quite a few of these awkward silences. Maybe he's trying to breathe slowly. Mark's decision here to relay a story about a guy is telling. He's not talking about science, trials or experiments. 
he wants to talk about stories. And these are the worst kind of evidence, if they can even be considered evidence at all. But he's not even talking about his patients, it's just something that he heard about and wrote in a book 10 years ago. But we'll come back to Mark's use of evidence later on. The, the next thing, infrared therapy, something called a biomat. You put it on your bed and you sleep on it. Okay. And that radiates light. It radiates light into the body. Okay. And that light turns to heat. And because you are a full degree below normal, and this is another reason you could be have gotten the cancer. You're cutting out there a bit, Mark. I don't know if... Yeah, sorry, your signal's quite bad. So you, you're saying my body temperature is too low, and that's another reason I could have got the cancer. Exactly, because it, the, temp, the immune system is directly tied mathematically to the body temperature. Okay. So we respond with, with heat. We heat you up. Very nice. Very nice treatment. Very comfortable. And are these things expensive? or? Yeah, a biomat would cost you a big one, 1700 so another one of the questions on Mark's patient intake form was about my body temperature. I gave him a temperature of 36.4 degrees Celsius or 97.5 Fahrenheit. Again, this is a perfectly normal body temperature. There's nothing unusual about that, but Mark thinks it might be another reason that I developed cancer. Mark seems to think that I'd benefit from this biomat that would heat me up, and although there are studies on the use of hyperthermia for cancer treatment, they mostly focus on using it to increase the effectiveness of radiation or chemotherapy. To the best of my knowledge, there is no reliable evidence of cancer being effectively treated using a biomat or any kind of similar device. But I jumped in there and cut Mark off, so let's go back to the consultation because we're not done with gadgets yet. And the most, the most expensive piece of equipment I would recommend, and also very important and gives you quite a bit of insurance, is a hydrogen inhalation machine where you breathe a hydrogen-oxygen mixture. This kind of machine, if you're dying and you're in ICU or an emergency room, it can bring you back from death's door. Right. Hydrogen inhalation has its effect everywhere, from the tip of your nose to your tip of your toes to your your um, uh, retina. I mean, it, hydrogen, because it's so small, gets everywhere and neutralizes the oxidative stress. So again, we have a fringe therapy being promoted as something that is exceptionally effective. I find it quite disturbing that Mark says breathing hydrogen could return you from death's door. This is an absurd exaggeration, and I really don't know where he got this idea from. There are a few studies on the use of hydrogen gas to treat cancer. One study published in the journal Medical Gases Research followed stage 3 and stage 4 cancer patients receiving hydrogen inhalation therapy. Of 61 stage 4 patients receiving this treatment, the disease progressed in most of them and 12 passed away over the duration of the study, so it's not a hugely impressive result. The authors did report some responses to hydrogen therapy in the stage 3 patients, but this study design generates the weakest kind of data because there's no control group. If hydrogen therapy is truly effective, a controlled trial should be able to demonstrate that, but it doesn't look like anyone's ever published one. But let's go back to the consultation with Mark. So, because um, we only have half an hour, so, I just wanted to ask an, another question here, Mark. You know, yeah. obviously, the doctors have said that testicular cancer is, is very treatable with, with conventional therapies, and they say they should be able to cure me. But, you know, you, you seem fairly skeptical about that. What would you say, you've worked with cancer patients, how successful are you in, in treating um, cancer or testicular cancer? Pretty successful, and people, you know, it's. E Listen to this. Even if you go the traditional route, I mean, they say they're very confident that they can cure you. Sure, by cutting off one of your balls, giving chemo, adding tremendous amount of toxicity to your body, and then possible radiation, which as a young man can kind of give you a promise of getting cancer five years down the road. So that even they're being successful is not so successful. If you go, you give yourself 30 or say 60 days of a full out treatment, the chances are very high that you will be to take care of this cancer. 
Okay. Cancer is treatable. It's treatable. It's how you treat it. Now, bicarbonate is a better chemotherapy than their chemical chemotherapy because that's toxic. So that was an interesting response from Mark, and it's something he had to pause and think about. Mark didn't really want to talk about how effective his treatments are, let alone put any numbers on the table, and I think that's quite informative. Mark is far more comfortable criticising conventional treatment than he is talking about how successful his methods are. He says that bicarbonate is a better chemotherapy because it's not toxic, but who cares if it's not toxic when it doesn't work? If you went to a real doctor and asked the same question, you'd get a prognosis based on research. It may not always be the answer that you want, some cancers can't be cured, and doctors can't predict exactly how your disease will respond to treatment or progress. But they can give you information about five-year survival rates, for example, and what happens to the typical patient with your disease. So at this point, I wanted to ask Mark exactly what working with him would entail. And so if I was considering, you know, working with you to help treat this cancer, what would I need to purchase the protocol or a program or... Well, most people's situation would would join my online clinic. That gives you, you know, uh, uh, ma makes me available to you even on a daily basis if necessary through either talking like we're doing now or text type where you can ask questions. And I get you up and running and I answer your questions as, you know, as they come up Okay. and kind of act as like a co coach. Right. And um, it works very well. So the cost of joining Mark Circus's online clinic is anywhere between $600 and $2,400. Now, since Mark hasn't proposed any treatments that are likely to be effective, and his main goal appears to be distracting people from effective advice from real doctors, I would submit that this does not constitute a bargain. But Mark has, I suppose, one more trick up his sleeve. The other big factor is you. I mean, not just your breathing and whether you're willing to really put yourself to it, but, um, you know, is in exploring why you got the cancer. And there are a lot of causes of cancer. And, of course, emotional stuff, stress, conflicts, these kind of things, too, if they're important in your case, need to be looked at and resolved. There are some people who it's the most important thing, meaning if they don't address their problems, their conflicts, no matter what they do, they don't get better. And it doesn't matter what disease they have. So let's say I go ahead and, and maybe I, I do the surgery or whatever the doctors say, but are you saying that without addressing the emotional problems, that treatment may not work? It, it might work in the temporary, you know, they might, you know, when, when you cut out, it's called cut and burn, you know, and you get very aggressive and you attack one part of the body and, uh, but you don't address the cause, which they don't do. I bet you a million dollars that there's not a doctor you're going to talk to who would tell you to slow your breathing down. Because if you don't slow your breathing down, you'll get the cancer again. Okay. Because you're depriving the cells of oxygen. So... It's really a, a you know a, a, a win-win situation. All your options are still always open, but you really you know with me at least you know we we bring powerful therapies to, to bear that addresses the fundamentals, and uh, of course look at any kind of emotional or any kind of conflicts and stuff like that. And even e even even if you eventually had to have surgery, even certainly there are ways to prepare the body for surgery that make the surgery much less traumatic, much less dangerous. So, and the doctors don't do any of these things. So okay. I rest my case. <laughs> so that would be the conclusion of Mark's pitch. And at this point, he was pushing the idea that emotional problems and personal conflicts are a cause of cancer and that his counseling on these issues would be an important part of his treatment package. I think the claim that emotional problems cause cancer is really quite dubious. The only concessions I would make on that would be that stress may increase cancer-causing behaviours like smoking and drinking alcohol, and that there are some effects of chronic stress on the immune system. This meta-analysis found that people with depressive disorder are not at an increased risk for developing cancer. If the relationship was as strong as, say, smoking and lung cancer, it should be pretty easy to detect in epidemiological data. 
I think it's worth adding here that Marx's conception seems to be focused on the idea that specific emotional issues or conflicts manifest as disease, which is pretty absurd. And there's another problem. There's no good reason to think that Mark is even a good counsellor or therapist. He has no real qualifications or formal training that I'm aware of, and there are many types of psychological interventions or strategies in therapy that are useless or even harmful. I think Mark is simply using this threat of cancer returning to sell these counselling sessions to people. At this point I felt like I'd heard enough from Mark, so I decided to explain to him that I don't really have cancer and pose him a more direct question. Mark, I, I want to come clean with you here actually. I'm not a, a cancer patient and I was just mostly interested in doing the consultation because I was interested about what you would say to someone who, who was a cancer patient. So, you know, for, first of all, sorry for the deception, but I felt like it was the, the best way to kind of pose these questions quite directly and get your honest responses. So actually, I'm someone who's quite skeptical of, of alternative treatments for cancer. And I find it quite surprising that you would say the causes of cancer would be breathing too fast or uh, maybe being too cold and emotional problems. But one question I'd really like to ask you is mm. what, what evidence do you have that your, your specific treatment protocol or, or kind of coaching helps people with cancer? Ten years of people communicating back to me and thanking me and some rescuing people from very you know severe situations okay so there we have it mark relies on people writing back to him and giving him positive feedback when asked how he knows his treatment works he immediately went back to personal stories the problem here of course is that in general dead people don't write back to say the treatment has failed mark is exceptionally exposed to survivorship bias here He's never systematically evaluated what his treatment does. He just runs his clinics and listens to feedback. This is exactly how medicine worked in the pre-scientific era, and it led to the propagation of lots of harmful treatments like bloodletting. Now, I go on to challenge Mark on this, so let's see how he responds. So do you have but any the, evidence you know, which isn't based on personal stories? Because one thing I'd, I'd kind of add here yeah. is that any medical claim or practice is always supported by personal stories, right? You can go to the doctor and he, he will tell you that, yes, his treatments work. And you can go online. You see people who say things like, you know, drinking urine cures diseases. And you'll see things like eating rotting meat cures diseases. So all of these strange practices are, su are supported by stories. So do you have any kind of evidence that is more than just, you know, your personal communications or experience? Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. And I mentioned one, just one thing. Most most of my work, if you've read any of my books, is based on not my experiences, but on medical science. Yeah, but you're not um, recommending medical science. Are you recommending a, yes, a, I am. a no, coaching no, protocol? I, a coaching protocol? No, and... no, no, no. That's not the case at all. When I recommend sodium bicarbonate, you know, you can read two. I just rewrote my essays on cancer and bicarbonate and the science is there. I have to say that I disagree with Mark here. And I think his specific protocol of emotional counseling, heated blankets, hydrogen machines and bicarbonates is so unique that it would need to be evaluated in its own right. In fact, I'm not even sure his method for treating cancer is defined clearly enough for it to be considered a method at all. Now, remember the first thing that Mark went to when prompted for evidence was personal stories and anecdotes. That's clearly his primary source of evidence, but now he says that his treatments are backed up by medical science. Mark says that he's recently rewritten his bicarbonate articles, so let's take a look at one of them. I'm going to read Bicarbonate Miracle and Cancer Part 1, and this article was published on Mark's website in February this year. Mark starts his article with the breathless promotional pitch for bicarbonate which has no links to any science or evidence and then he moves on to a section titled absolute certainty i'm going to read directly from mark's article here before we present the science that sustains all the above assertions be aware of how firm and certain this all is for cancer patients as certain as the idea that your breathing keeps you alive there is no room for a shred of doubt with bicarbonates and what they do Imagine the best basketball player up in the air making a slam dunk. The ball is already halfway through the hoop. How much would you bet on him making the score? 
Not sure what else to say to communicate how certain simple baking soda is in its ability to turn the tide of acidic low oxygen conditions, thus saving millions of cancer patients' lives. Baking soda is good. It is a gift from nature, a gift from God. So with an introduction like that, I think we should expect some pretty strong evidence in the rest of the article. So Mark's first offering is a 1925 promotional pamphlet from the Arm & Hammer Baking Soda Company, suggesting that people can use baking soda to treat body odour, headaches, hiccups and hives. Strangely enough though, Arm & Hammer weren't promoting the use of bicarbonate for treating cancer. Never mind though, because we're about to move on to the next section of Mark's article which is titled Overwhelming Science. Mark opens with a quote from a 1940s medical encyclopedia. Now, although Mark may feel that this quote is relevant because it speaks to some of his confusion about oxygen and carbon dioxide, the quote is not concerned with bicarbonate, nor is it concerned with the treatment of cancer. It's about the inhalation of carbon dioxide. So this quote can't be part of the overwhelming science. Next, Mark relays a message he received from a Russian man that lives not far from him. Apparently, this Russian man was diagnosed with cancer and started taking bicarbonate three times a day, and now he takes it once a day and feels great. Now, I hope by now that I don't need to point out the obvious, but a message from a Russian gentleman is not science, nor could it ever be part of overwhelming science. We could dismiss this story out of hand, but I wanted to point out a couple of things. Firstly, there's no mention of whether this Russian gentleman accepted other treatments for his cancer, and there's actually no clear indication that his cancer has been cured. He just says he feels great. If Mark really had overwhelming science, he wouldn't be sharing these kind of stories. Next up, we have a quote from Otto Warburg, and to be fair, no crank article on cancer treatment would be complete without one. Otto Warburg may have had a strong opinion on the cause of cancer, but despite his strident beliefs, he never developed any successful treatment for cancer, and he didn't support the use of bicarbonate either. So again, this is a quote, it's not an experiment, it's not a trial, it's not even a quote about a proposed treatment. Following this, Mark links to an article in Medical Hypothesis. Now this is an unusual journal because it was famous for having no peer review. The journal's founder wanted to promote fringe voices and ideas in science without the gatekeeping of peer review. That doesn't mean that everything published in Medical Hypotheses is wrong, but these articles were only ever reviewed for being coherent and clearly expressed. Having said that, the article Mark linked to is not a report of a trial or experiment, and it's not about bicarbonate. The authors propose that cancer is caused by hypoxia, which is brought about by eating the wrong kinds of fats and fatty acids, and they say that polyunsaturated fatty acid consumption may prevent cancer. To be honest, I didn't read any more than that. This article can't be part of the overwhelming science that Mark is trying to present because it's not about bicarbonate. And now we have some more quotes from Nobel Prize winners that aren't about bicarbonate, and finally a link to some scientific research. So Mark says that researchers at the University of Texas have found that important regulatory molecules are decreased when cells are deprived of oxygen, which leads to increased cancer progression in vitro and in vivo. Okay, so let's go to the article, which is pretty complex, and actually had a correction to one of the figures, which is quite interesting. But is it about using bicarbonate to treat cancer? No, it's about microRNA biogenesis and hypoxia. Next, Mark links to one of his own articles on the use of bicarbonate in emergency medicine, which is rather self-aggrandizing. Does he really think his blog posts are part of overwhelming science, fit to be compared to his lofty quotes from Nobel Prize winners? Well, apparently so, but even Mark's article isn't about using bicarbonate to treat cancer. And then Mark provides us with another story and a link to another one of his books. But now, finally, we get to a relevant scientific article. Mark says that bicarbonate shrinks tumours, and he links us to this paper published in 2009 to support that statement. So let's take a look at that paper. What did the authors do? Well, they took mice with essentially no functional immune system, and they injected them with human cancer cell lines. They allowed tumours to grow for six days, and then randomised the mice to normal water or water supplemented with sodium bicarbonate. And the first result reported by these authors, bicarbonate therapy had no effect on either the animal weights or the rate of growth of the primary tumours. So Mark's claim that bicarbonate shrinks tumours is contradicted by the article he linked. Far from shrinking the primary tumour, bicarbonate didn't even slow its growth. The authors go on to say, Despite a lack of an effect on primary tumour growth, bicarbonate therapy led to significant reductions in the number and size of metastases to the lung, intestine and diaphragm. So not only did bicarbonate fail to slow the growth of the tumour, it also didn't stop the cancer from spreading. You can put a positive spin on that and say it slowed the spread down, but it's hardly a miracle cure because the mice would have died anyway. 
So is this overwhelming science? No, it's a limited experiment with modest results. None of the animals were cured, and the primary tumour continued to grow and spread during bicarbonate therapy. The authors provide an honest appraisal of the caveats of this treatment approach in humans. Just to be clear, Mark summarised this article by saying that bicarbonate shrinks tumours, and he told me that bicarbonate would stop the growth of my tumour in one day. If anything, the results of this study show the opposite. Mark goes on to link a blog post by Dr. Veronique de Saunier on Green Med Info. She's another alt medicine crank who actually lied about having breast cancer and curing herself from it. I don't consider her articles to be part of overwhelming science. And he also links to a review on the sodium ion on proton exchanger in cancer, which is again a review and a discussion of ideas. It's not an experiment or a trial, and it's not about the use of bicarbonate to treat cancer. There's an account I follow on Twitter with the handle No Wine, No People, which retweets articles where people make health claims about the benefits of wine. The point that No Wine, No People is trying to make is that most of these articles are based on research that wasn't conducted on humans or didn't use wine. Similarly, Mark's articles on the use of bicarbonate to treat cancer in humans contain no such research. They're collections of quotes, studies on hypoxia and studies on animals that he can't summarise accurately. Mark thinks there's a connection between hypoxia and the pH of tumours and oxygen, and he's come to believe that bicarbonate should be an effective treatment. It seems like Mark believes that any article that discusses these ideas supports his hypothesis, even when they have nothing to do with bicarbonate, and even when they contradict him. This is an overwhelming science. In fact, Mark's articles barely form a coherent thought. They're just a jumble of ideas and grandiose statements. Even if the basic science supported Mark, which it doesn't, you'd still need to demonstrate that bicarbonate is a safe and effective treatment by giving it to people suffering from cancer in a controlled trial. So what does overwhelming science look like? Well, this systematic review and meta-analysis of the management of stage 1 testicular cancer using conventional therapies references 23 unique studies conducted on human patients including nearly 4,000 individual patients. Mark's article includes a message from a Russian gentleman. And that's the difference. So despite Mark protesting to me on the call that he's following medical science, that clearly isn't the case. And the real problem here is that Mark doesn't know what science is. So I think I'm going to bring this video to an end here. I hope this has been illuminating. I certainly enjoyed finding out what kind of things are going on in these consultations. I'm not at all surprised, but certainly disappointed. The main thrust of Mark Circus's pitch is to rubbish effective treatments and sell his coaching appointments and devices. I think Mark Circus probably believes all this claptrap about bicarbonate, he seems like an enormous narcissist. And it's hard to know what to call someone who's ripping off other people when they really believe in what they're doing. Are they still a scammer? What I would say about Mark is that he should know better. It's on everyone to think about their own ideas critically, and Mark is apparently too arrogant to do that, and now his bloated ego is harming people who go to him for help. I wanted to cover a few points about the making of this video. First of all, I edited this consultation quite significantly. I didn't change the order of our conversation, but I did remove sections where we talked over each other, where Skype glitched out, and I removed just a horrible nervous laugh that I made. I think the editing was done fairly, and I didn't do it to make Mark look worse than he is, but if you want to listen to the unabridged conversation, I've uploaded it as an unlisted video, there's a link in the description. I also thought a fair bit about whether or not it was justified to deceive Mark by pretending to be a cancer patient. In the end, I think it was the right thing to do. I don't think I could have gotten a candid interview with Mark as a skeptic, and the way his attitude changed at the end of the interview confirmed that for me. There are lots of videos on YouTube where people bait scammers or play hidden camera pranks, and to be honest, I don't place this deception as any worse than that. Even though Mark said there was no integrity to making this video, he did shout, you can do whatever you want, at the end of the consultation, which I took as his consent. And after all, I did pay Mark for this call, so I think it's fair to record it. And that brings me to my last point. This video took me a long time to make, and it also, obviously, cost me money. If you want to support my channel, why not share the video? If you watch my videos regularly, please check to make sure you're subscribed and click the bell. The more engagement I get on these videos, the more likely they are to be recommended to people who haven't discovered my channel yet. So watching my videos to the end, leaving comments and likes really helps. If this video proves popular and the AdSense revenue can't cover the cost of production, I'll have to think about more ways to make YouTube more sustainable. I never expected to make money from these videos, but I don't want to end up out of pocket either. Anyway, what I'm going to do here is run the rest of the interview with Mark, and as he comes to understand that I don't have cancer, he gets more aggravated and starts criticising chemotherapy and conventional treatment again. 
This is essentially his default position. Rather than demonstrating how effective Mark's circus is, he just whinges about conventional medicine. I don't do an amazing job of responding to his comments, but then I never really intended to debate Mark. It's not something that I find especially useful. I'd rather sit down in my own time and establish the facts. I won't be responding to this last bit, so I'll see you in the next video. Thanks. So you, you're saying you don't have cancer? Is that what no, you no, said no, before? Yeah, I don't, I don't have cancer, no. I, just, I was just curious to see what you would say to someone who presented as having cancer. Oh, well, you heard it. Thanks, Mark. Just from curiosity. This was just curiosity, or you work for some company that... You know, so I, I, like I, that, make, I make videos about natural and alternative medicine and the people who support these, these natural treatments. And, you know, obviously I've recorded this call and, you know, I'm going to talk about the kind of advice that you would give. And from, from a scientific perspective, it's not very good advice, right? Delaying, What's cancer, not very good advice? delaying, delaying cancer treatment is, is, is dangerous. It does lead to an increased risk of cancer spreading. Um, and there's, there's plenty of evidence for that. There's, there's very good evidence supporting the use of chemotherapy, especially in testicular cancer. Testicular cancer is very responsive to chemotherapy. Um, yeah, and, it and, is. But, yes, but, it is. And you said but, that chemotherapy but, but, is what, what, useless. But, well, in your situation, when they say they're going to cut, if you have one of your testicles is cancerous. Yeah. And they cut it out. Yeah. What are they using the chemotherapy for? It's not to treat the testicle because they've removed it. Yeah, but there's this to treat any what cancer mean, cells that, that have spread. Wait, hold, hold on a second. What? You just said yes, but, which means that you're not. You're I'm agreeing that they were. No, I'm not. Listen. Okay, fine. Yes, they removed the cancerous testicle and then they apply the chemotherapy to treat any cancer that might have spread to your lymph nodes. It's very straightforward. The lymph node or the bones or yeah. the prostate. And the, the, chemotherapy, the chemotherapy is very effective at cleaning that up. That's what it's for. And, and you have proof of that? Yeah, there's scientific evidence for it. There's loads of trials. Oh, oh, really? And that's why, that's why, how many, pe how many thousands of people die every day of cancer? Because they're so successful with chemotherapy and they have all the science. What is it? Nine, uh, how many people? It's nine million people die a year of cancer because chemotherapy and radiation. How many did you say, Mark? Is successful. How many? How many? Do you I think say it's a day? nine million. No, no, it's nine million a year. It's twenty-seven thousand people a day die of cancer because the field of oncology is very successful. And there's a I mean, lot Mark, of Mark, that Mark, doesn't make very much sense. Mark, Mark, you could you could point to let's say the number of people killed in in car crashes every day, and then you could say, oh well, seat belts don't work, right? I mean, cancer treatment is difficult. It's not perfect. OK, it doesn't work all the time, but there are cases where treatments are very effective. Chemotherapy for testicular cancer is one of those cases where it works very well. OK, so, you know, you can go back no, and say no, loads of people, it, loads of people die from cancer. Yes, therefore, it, it, cancer treatment doesn't work. That doesn't that doesn't mean that all cancer treatment is ineffective. Does just just as much as saying that some people die in a car crash doesn't say that we shouldn't put our seatbelts on. I didn't say that. I didn't, I didn't say that. You and said, oh, 9 million people listen, die man, per year. Listen, without, listen to me. You recorded me Yes. without my permission. If you had my permission and you're honest, but you should not. It, there's no integrity in making a report about what you got from this video because you did it dishonestly okay, Mark, and behind my back think. between that's... not being honest with me. No, it's true. Okay, if that's, Now, if you that's can what do you whatever you want. Well, thanks for your permission then.